everyone. It's Hello. A lot of familiar Hi. faces. Hello. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, well, we'll go ahead and get started. I know a couple folks might be joining late, um, but just don't want to take up too much more of your time because we have some really exciting presentations tonight. Um, but thank you all for being here. I know a couple of you have joined us in prior sessions, so it's uh, really exciting to see you all again. Um, just a quick reminder before we get started this evening to just mute your microphone when you're not speaking. It will help reduce background noise um, and will ensure kind of a smoother meeting experience. We will be recording each of our meetings this month, so we'll follow up by sending out materials um, from tonight's session and then kind of towards the end of our Gateway Community Summit, we will list things on our website for reference as well. Um, additionally, if you have any comments or questions during the meeting, feel free to use the chat feature. Claire and I will be monitoring that throughout um, tonight's session. So let us know if you have any questions. It's just the chat icon towards the bottom of your screen. Um, it will be a great way to kind of keep the messaging going. Um, before we begin, I would like to respectfully acknowledge the lands the CDT traverses are native lands. We can't begin a conversation about the CDT or public lands without acknowledging the history of these lands. The lands that the CDT traverses are the lands of the Chiricahua Apache, Western Apache, Zuni, Pueblo, Diné, Ute, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Eastern Shoshone, Shoshone Bannock, Lemhi Shoshone, Absaluk, Nietzsche Tepe, Salish Kootenai, Tunaha, Sutsina, along with the many other people and tribes that traveled and lived on these lands before colonization. We honor these people, past, present, and future, and all indigenous peoples who inhabited, stewarded, and held sacred the land along this, the continental divide. CDTC respectfully acknowledges that indigenous peoples have lived, worked, and traveled here since time immemorial. Land acknowledgements are only the first step and we commit ourselves to educating others and conserving this landscape to honor the people who were here before us and to reduce the adverse effects of colonization of these lands for the people of present and future. So thank you all again for being here. My name is Liz Schmidt. I'm the Community and Outreach Program Manager for the CDTC. I work primarily with our Gateway Community Program and the Gateway Community Summit is something we look forward to every year. Um, so it's really exciting to see you all tonight. Um, but with that, I'd like to turn it over to my amazing colleagues, starting with Al Fisher, uh, who's going to kick us off for this evening. Excellent. Thanks so much, Liz. And let me start by sharing my screen here. And then, yeah, can you all see that? I could. Get a yes. verbal yes from Liz or Claire. Yes. Thank you so much. Awesome. Uh, yes, thank you all so much for joining us um, this evening for our Gateway Community Summit webinar, Pathways for Action. Um, it's so good to see so many familiar faces as well as some new faces in the crowd this evening. Um, so thank you all for spending some time with us this evening. Um, we're going to have a really great discussion um, on how to turn your passion for the CDT into action. Um, so you'll be hearing tonight um, from three folks from the CDTC staff. Um, I'm, I'm Elle Fisher, they, them pronouns. Um, I'm based up on the uh, lands of the Blackfeet in Helena, Montana. I'm CDTC's trail policy manager. Um, and I'm joined tonight by Jordan Williams, our Colorado regional representative, and Corey Terivio, our New Mexico regional representative, who will introduce themselves later on in the presentation. But if you all want to come off uh, camera or turn your cameras on and just give a wave right now just so folks know who you are. Um, our uh, contact info is on here because we definitely want um, to be seen as a resource throughout this discussion. So um, if you have questions that come up or if there's a specific topic that you, you know, kind of want to dig deeper on, um, definitely feel free to uh, reach out to us after this, um, this conversation. The conversation doesn't have to end um, at this webinar. We can keep the conversation going afterwards. So I just want to provide that um, all for you all as well. 
and our learning objectives today. So I am hoping um, we all walk away with more information on how CDTC mobilizes our trail community and our trail champions. Um, we really wanna hope, we hope you walk away with more confidence um, in using your voice to speak up for the CDT. And we really wanna provide some really tangible next steps for how you can get involved. Um, but most importantly, we just wanna provide you with new ways to turn your passion for the CDT into action. So a little bit of a session overview for our presentation this evening. Um, so we'll start with talking about levels of engagement. What do we really mean when we say like policy and advocacy and um, engaging um, with decision makers in that capacity? So we'll dive a little bit into that. Um, and then we'll talk about CD, the CDT Completion Act, which is something um, anyone in our CDT trail community can uh, really help support that effort. And it's kind of our flagship piece of legislation moving through Congress currently. Um, and then we'll move into some discussion um, from Jordan Williams about engagement in Colorado and talk a little bit about a case study um, at the Camp Hill Continental Divide National Monument and how CDTC really helped mobilize our trail community in that area to uh, advocate for that national monument designation. Um, and then we'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Corey Terivia to talk about engagement in New Mexico, talking about how CDTC uh, engages with tribal communities. Um, and then we'll end um, today's webinar with ways to get involved. So things you can actually do today to use your voice um, for the CDT. Um, and then at the end, we do have some time saved for question and answers if anyone has any you know, um, last minute uh, conversation that they wanna have. So to get us started, what do we mean when we talk about levels of engagement? So, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, I tell people I'm a trail policy manager and they have no idea what that means. Um, I honestly didn't know what that means when I was starting uh, this position, uh, really. Uh, the world of policy is a confusing one often. Um, but most of the time, what people think of when they talk, when they think about policy engagement or talking with uh, a politician or a decision maker um, in DC, um, they oftentimes are thinking about lobbying. So lobbying is this very um, limited activity. So it's when you're sitting in a room, talking with a politician, trying to like convince them either to support or oppose a, a topic or a piece of legislation. Um, but what CDTC does and what we actually do with a lot of our trail community doesn't ever reach into that level of lobbying. We're oftentimes not asking for you know, a specific support or opposition to some, something. Oftentimes we're looking to just educate that decision maker on the CDT, um, on the great communities that the CDT connects and the issues that those communities are facing and what their priorities are. Um, and sometimes, you know, that moves into the, uh, the level of advocacy. So um, you'll see in the pictures to the, to the right there, um, a group of folks we took from all across their trails. So we have um, folks from Colorado, Montana, Lincoln, Montana up here. Um, and we, all those uh, people flew to DC with us during our annual hike the hill. Um, and they actually were able to um, advocate um, for their communities and their priorities for the communities um, in DC directly with their decision makers. It wasn't necessarily saying, hey, we want you to support the CDT Completion Act. It was, hey, our community really loves the CDT. It's bringing a lot of energy. It's bringing a lot of economic development, but we could really use some sidewalks. And that's how, um, you know, that's how, what would help hikers when they get to town. And that's what, what would help our community to really thrive um, you know, if we have more sidewalks around town or, you know, what sort of infrastructure investments or other investments um, in those communities could really help. So uh, oftentimes, like I said, our CDTC, CDTC and our trail community, we're really staying in this advocacy, education and advocacy space that anyone can get involved in. It doesn't just have to be a lobbyist. There aren't really any restrictions on education and advocacy. You really don't reach those limits until you get into that very small narrow category of lobbying, which is in that room with that decision maker asking for a specific action. Um, so anyone on the call today just about can probably get involved in some education and advocacy with us. And I know many of you actually on the call have participated in things like virtual fly-ins with our members of Congress. Um, so you're already probably familiar with what this education space actually looks like. So why does um, CDTC engage and why do we ask our trail, uh, our trail community to engage? And it's really about stewarding the CDT. Um, so, you know, <clears throat> to steward the CDT, oftentimes our biggest ask when we go to decision makers or our biggest, um, you know, barrier um, that we're coming up against is oftentimes that funding and capacity resource uh, and resources. So trail stewardship takes funding, it takes staff, it takes partnerships and a lot of other resources to maintain the CDT. So that is one of our biggest, you know, biggest things that we like to educate 
um, our decision makers on. Um, you know, it is uh, oftentimes CDTC being a good partner and advocating for our partners in the Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management and asking, hey, these people, they need more money for trail crews to actually steward the CDT. They need more, you know, uh, more capacity in their partnership agreement office so that we can actually do volunteer um, events and things like that. So oftentimes when we're going, when we're talking about advocating uh, for capacity and resources, it's just what does this community or this section of the trail really need to make it, you know, this optimal resource, this resource that everyone can enjoy. And it's just those basics of stewardship, things like staffing, things like funding um, that we're all pretty familiar with, I'm sure. Um, and then, you know, we're also want to be on the front edge of emerging impacts and priorities. So CDCC and the trail community can really lead on actions and decisions impacting the continental divide landscape. You know, when um, there are these opportunities um, you know, for things like maybe a national outdoor equity grant that would get more uh, youth and more communities out on the trail. How can we um, really be on the front line of that that policy decision or that possible outdoor equity fund to really tell the story of how that could really benefit the CDT and our communities all along the trail landscape? Or it's uh, about being, you know, on the front edge of things like um, uh, electric e-bikes and how e-bikes will actually, you know, potentially change how the CDTC or how the CDT needs to be managed. Um, so those emerging impacts and priority, priorities, things like, you know, climate change, things like, um, uh, you know, all those different things that impact the trail landscape. Um, uh, really, it takes like a holistic perspective to really address those needs. And so, and so CDTC and our trail community can really help um, lead on that narrative on what are the big things happening on the CDT? What can we talk to our decision makers about to make sure they're aware that this is having a real impact uh, on the ground? Um, and then um, like I've kind of already talked about, we really are engaging in this work and stewarding the CDT because we want to build community. Uh, preservation of the CDT requires action, collaboration, and education. Um, so it takes all, all of us to really edu uh, educate our decision makers on what the CDT experience is and what the CDT really means to our communities, right? So, um, you know, if we're advocating, you know, in, uh, with folks in Lincoln, Montana, um, and calling into Senator Danes's office, and their main priority is, um, you know, like I said, sidewalks um, along their main highway so people can walk in their community to the gas station or the grocery store. Um, but it's also, you know, it's going to benefit our hikers who are coming into that town as well, going to better connect them to the town as well. So, you know, when we're advocating for things that are good for the community, it really raises all ships and it helps the CDT experience really be an optimal one for everyone. So we're really building that community and not just focusing on the trail, not just focusing on that 12, uh, you know, 12 inch, 18 inch tread, not just focusing on the mild walk wide corridor, but really looking at the continental divide landscape as a whole and looking at those communities that exist there and seeing how we can build um, build up everyone in those communities. And so I want to talk a little bit about kind of our flagship um, piece of legislation that I know um, just about everyone can get involved in um, along the CDT. So um, the CDT completion, so right now we're about 95% um, complete. But um, you know that wasn't always the case. Um, back when the, the CDT was the first designated in 1978, obviously we didn't have any trail designated. Um, you know, some of the trail might have existed, but we didn't know it was the CDT yet. Um, and then, um, you know, over the next, uh, you know, 30 years about, um, the CDT, you know, was put onto public land, was identified through forest sections, um, but we were still about 60% complete um, in 2009. Um, but in 2009, uh, something big happened for the trail in that the omnibus bill was signed into law, which granted this willing seller authority. So where those gap areas existed in that other 30% of trail, um, the agencies like the Forest Service, BLM, National Park Service, finally had the authority under that law to actually go to uh, private landowners and say, are you willing to sell? Um, you know, is this something you'd be interested in? Is there an easement that we can do in this section of the trail? And so from 2009 to 2020, that willing seller authorization really helped us um, to elevate the CDT and the story of completion. And we got almost 30% more of the trail completed by 2020. Um, and then we had a really big landmark um, law passed in 2020 as well called the Great American Outdoors Act. And that permanently funded Land and Water Conservation Fund um, uh, in its entire, uh, in perpetuity. And so that land and water conservation fund is oftentimes the only money that we have to actually complete the trail. And, um, you know, if there is a willing seller to actually, you know, buy that willing seller's um, land uh, that they're willing to sell for the CDT. Um, so that's where that funding really comes from. So in 2020, that was 
um, actually fully funded. And so our, we had both the authority with the willing seller agreement, we had the money to do it with the Great American Outdoors Act. And so now with both those tools, we really saw an opportunity to prior prioritize completion of the CDT. So in 2021, Representative Nagus introduced the CDT Completion Act to Congress. Um, and then um, shortly the year after, it was actually introduced in the Senate by Senator Heinrich, co-sponsored by Senator Daines from Montana. Um, and now that in 2023, we have the bipartisan CDT Completion Act is moving through Congress and our trail is 95% complete. So we still have about 160 miles um, where those that are looking for that, you know, continuous walk on public lands are forced onto the less scenic, less safe highways and roadways. So you can kind of get a visual of where those uh, gap areas of the CDT exist. Um, so uh, I won't go over all the gap areas, but we have major gap areas uh, in Butte, Rollins, um, Muddy Pass in Colorado, Pie Town Grant in, in Grants in New Mexico and Cuba in New Mexico. So a lot of our, our gap areas are on the Southern portion of the trail. Um, but like I said, uh, all these gap areas are where those um, folks are being moved off of uh, protected public lands and kind of onto busy roadways and highways that make the experience not only less scenic, but a less safe experience for everyone. So what does the CDT Completion Act actually do? So completion, uh, the Completion Act aims to complete the CDT by the trail's 50th anniversary in 2028. So it's really prioritizing um, completion of the CDT in that time span. Um, so it does that by uh, creating the CDT completion team under the Department of Interior and the U.S. Department of Agriculture. So that's the Forest Service and BLM and National Park Service um, would have to be on a CDT completion team that really is focused on completing the CDT. Um, and part of this legislation does require that community engagement um, that there is community engagement in completing those gap areas. So we certainly don't want the federal government, you know, just, uh, you know, prescribe where the trail should go, you know, totally not informed by our communities that are going to be impacted by any sort of completion efforts. So our community uh, engagement is required in that bill. Um, and I always like to say it is very clearly not a land grab. So in that bill, uh, eminent domain is explicitly uh, is explicitly prohibited, not not prohibited. So ex explicitly prohibited. So um, eminent domain is not allowed at all um, under this bill. So um, once again, that community connection is going to be a big factor in completing the trail because um, there has to be that willing seller authorization and willing sellers on the ground um, willing to help with those gap areas. Um, and then the bill also does require consultation with tribes, land grant communities, and acequia communities, um, particularly in New Mexico, um, but across the gap areas. So um, that indigenous consultation is a very big piece of this bill as well. Um, and then I always like to say there is no additional appropriation. So the funding, like I mentioned, comes from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. There is no additional appropriations attached to this bill, which I'm sure some of us have been keeping up with the shutdown talks. It's very nice to not have a to have a bill that does not have any, you know, funding or appropriations attached to it. it makes things a little bit easier. Um, but I always like to point that out. Um, <clears throat> and what the CDT Completion Act um, really has done is. You know, it hasn't only, you know, there are multiple goals for this bill. Um, obviously, the primary goal is to complete the trail. Um, but the CDT Completion Act has really been um, a, a piece of legislation that our, we've really seen our community rally around. So, you know, it is an integral part of CDT's mission to complete, promote, and protect the trail. Um, but we hear from hikers all the time that, you know, those roadwalks, they are less safe. They are less scenic. It's not what you're looking for in a national scenic trail. Um, and so, you know, it's making that experience a better one for everyone, not only visitors to the trail, but locals in their own community who want to experience the trail as well. Um, and so, yeah, once again, that CDT completion is going to create more of that connection for communities like Steamboat Springs, where they have a 15 section of trail, uh, 15 mile section of trail that's a highway, you know, for the folks in Steamboat Springs, that's not a beautiful walk. Um, so creating, you know, these opportunities for communities to look uh, to really um, have a connection more to the, the trail in their region is really important as well. Um, and oftentimes, you know, we hear about the boost for benefits for communities. So, you know, completing this trail is not only good for the business and economic opportunities that more people from uh, more people on the trail are going to give to local communities, um, but it's also great for health benefits for local communities who have more opportunities to get outside and exercise. It's really great for, you know, schools who have programming and outdoor education professionals who can get out on the CDC and use it as like a living outdoor classroom. 
Um, so those benefits are really holistic. And so when we're talking about the CDT, um, it is more about, it is more than just the, the miles on the ground and getting those. It is really about rallying around this really important resource um, that is really an iconic experience for um, not only visitors, but for um, you know, locals who have it in their own backyard um, as well. Um, and the CDT completion, I always like to say, it's just this really tangible goal that we can all rally around and we can all kind of be champions um, of this shared goal. And so to wrap up um, kind of my section of the speaking, I'll, I'm about to turn it over to um, Jordan Williams to talk about uh, engagement in Colorado. Um, but I did wanna highlight, we do have an opportunity to speak up today. So tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Mountain Time, um, the CDT Completion Act will have a markup in the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. Um, and so uh, if you're, you're a member of Congress to sit on those committees, um, you know, reach out, share your words of support, um, obviously, Senator Daines and Senator Heinrich uh, are very supportive, but it never hurts to say a thank you to them as well. And then I do want to specifically shout out to our Wyoming Trail community. Um, if I could ask you all to do me a favor, call Senator Ross's office and tell him you'd like to see him uh, support the CGT Completion Act. Um, you know, if you know someone in Wyoming, if you're, you know, your grandma, your second cousin, your ex-girlfriend lives in Wyoming, um, let them know that, uh, you know, CDT Completion uh, is an important thing for the state and um, that they should call Senator Bross's office because he is a key vote on that committee that could determine whether that bill moves forward or not. Um, so yes, that is my one ask for our Wyoming folks in particular today. Please um, initiate that outreach. That would be so helpful um, ahead of tomorrow's hearing. Um, and with that, I know I've gone a little bit over time, so I want to quickly turn it over to Jordan Williams. Awesome. Thanks, Al. And yeah, we totally timed that so that this presentation would be the day before the Senate Natural Resources and Energy Committee hearing. So great job, staff, on everyone timing that appropriately. And that ask um, was integrated very well. So that, that's awesome that there's something tangible that we're doing. But I, I again, I'm Jordan Williams. I'm the Colorado Regional Rep for CDTC. And I started uh, it feels like two years ago, but I think it was closer to a year and a half. Um, so it's been it's been a, a fun run so far. And right when I started, um, this effort for this Camp Hill Continental Divide National Monument was right on our plate. So it was a pretty unique opportunity for me to start with CDTC and really hit the ground running with this campaign. Um, was guided by a lot of great people, a lot of great partners, specifically L and our executive director Teresa Martinez. Obviously, did a ton of great work. So this was a, a full team effort, but we thought it would be appropriate uh, in terms of making something really tangible as an example of how CDTC and our community partners and, and other organizations uh, can, can be involved at, at this more tangible level for today. So uh, if you want to go next slide, Elle. So just a quick outline uh, for my talk here. So we'll go through a kind of a timeline, talk about the storytelling components of the of the Camp Hill Continental Divide National Monument campaign, um, talk about our small businesses that were involved, uh, hopefully some future management actions coming along after the fact now, and then uh, uh, just a little hint at what's next in Colorado, hopefully some, some opportunities coming up uh, as well. So... This photo is actually at the, the at one of the trailheads at Camp Hale. So that that was <laughs> not just a random photo. <laughs> um, all right, thanks, so. Elle. You can go to the next slide. So just really quick on the timeline because this was uh, a long a long term effort with a lot of work put in by a lot of people again before I was here uh, and as well as CDTC. So the core act came together was a bunch of several several public lands bills uh, that were kind of rolled into one uh, Colorado Outdoor Recreation Economy Act, different areas of the state. Um, there, there's a great website uh, that we'll share on that uh, if you want to learn more because this bill has still not been passed. So one of the components of the bill uh, was a Camp Hale uh, historic landscape, as well as some protections in the 10 mile mountain range of Colorado, which included the CDT. So the, the Camp Hale Continental Divide area was actually part of this act and it was a long time coming. It passed the House of Representatives multiple times, but uh, couldn't quite make it out of the Senate and there are 60 uh, votes required on, on these types of bills makes that a bit more of a challenge on the Senate side. So Senator Bennett really took it upon himself uh, in, in an election year um, to go out and really try to get some more 
grassroots support for public lands in Colorado through a national monument campaign in conjunction with the groups that were supporting the core act, of course. Um, and you can learn more about that on our website too, at our conservation page, which was put in the chat. But we, we transitioned to this national monument effort because um, I, I don't want to get too far in the weeds, but the, for people who don't know, national monuments can be designated just by the president and don't require congressional approval in the Senate and the House of Representatives. So it's a bit of a different type of protection that's allowed uh, under uh, the Antiquities Act. So this coalition, uh, working with Senator Bennett's office in some degree and other organizations and partners, we met biweekly and there, there was uh, in the lead up to the 2022 um, election, there, there was a lot going on with press releases and tours and letters to the editor in support of this transitioning the Camp El Cotton Divide uh, effort to a national monument protection. Um, and then through a lot of work on that committee and a lot of talks with President Biden's uh, cabinet administration, uh, Senator Bennett and, and all the other folks involved uh, got the president to designate Camp Hale on October 12th, 2022 at, at the site. So the president came out and did that. So for everyone who doesn't know, we'll go to the next slide. And it um, and actually before we show the photo, we'll show the video which commemorates uh, this. So this was put together by CDTC and some other partners, but it kind of encapsulates uh, the, the end of the effort and the proclamation. So hopefully everyone kind of heard that. I know it, uh, the volume can be a little wonky on Zoom, but it's a fun video. It's on our website too, if if for some reason that didn't come through well. But here is uh, President Biden signing the proclamation at Camp Hill with uh, some veterans from the 10th Mountain Division. I wasn't there at the signing, but Teresa, our executive director, was. Uh, and I did get to go to the after party, though, in Vail, and that's us um, afterwards also voicing support for the Thompson Divide, which was another public lands campaign at the time. So, uh, yeah, that was, a, that was a good time on October 12th, um, just a year ago, which is crazy. Awesome. Next slide, Al. Uh, and so just to kind of back up a little bit in terms of what went into that effort uh, and how it kind of came about from more of a qualitative point of view, uh, you know, I think the these public lands campaigns uh, National Monument efforts and others, you know, the storytelling really matters and, and Camp Hale and the Continental Divide landscape have some unique stories to tell. These photos right here, you know, are the beautiful 10 mile range um, outside of Breckenridge. Uh, EcoFlight took those photos. Um, so that was an important uh, component of that effort was documenting, you know, how amazing and uh, beautiful the landscape is. And then this photo uh, is of a group of hikers that we took out on the Continental Divide Trail on the Camp Hale side on National Public Lands Day. And a lot of those photos um, that you saw in the video and uh, the B-roll and stuff came from that hike as well because it was uh, obviously during the beautiful fall color season. And so, you know, again, it helps tell that story of, of, of the specialness of that area. But in particular, you know, the, the veterans who trained at Camp Hale are an important component. And, you know, there's uh, veterans uh, and their importance at the congressional level really hold a lot of sway in terms of getting people to care and listen. And, and they have some great advocacy groups. So working with them, uh, we were really able to amplify that effort in terms of getting a lot of recognition uh, alongside the importance of the history of the area in terms of 
you know, those veterans then went to World War II and, and the 10th Mountain Division and, and the things that happened fighting the Nazis. And there, there's a huge story component to that history, but also the recreation stuff that came out of it. So a lot of the people who were veterans as part of Camp Hale came back and founded the ski industry, essentially at, based out of Vail in Colorado after that war where they had trained on the mountains as part of ski warfare. So it rolls into today's values where Camp Hale and the 10 Mile Range are, are getting used for a ton of recreation. There's CDT just being a part of that uh, motorized climbing, uh, winter sports, um, skiing, obviously. So uh, there's a huge component of that. They, uh, Senator Bennett and the the partners really worked on engaging the Ute tribes. So the, the two tribes in Utah, the Ute Mountain Utes and the Southern Utes um, who are in Colorado. And then the the Utah Reservation and Utah, the state of Utah as well. Um, and working with those groups to to recognize that those were the traditional homeland of the Ute and that they were forcibly removed and those lands were stolen from them. So telling that story and and validating that in the proclamation and, and working towards a better future was a was a is an important component and will be ongoing uh, with the Camp Hill kind of divide natural monument effort. So yeah, writing those past wrongs. Um, the 10th Mountain Division at that time during World War II was a segregated division as as the military was and so you know uh people of color were explicitly excluded and and we don't want to back away from those stories in terms of the preservation and advocacy for these lands because we we have the opportunity to to do better um with with these efforts and campaigns and so using that that national monument effort and um designation as a way to bring those different groups together and really tell uh, a story that can be evolving and improve uh, really the area preservation wise and access wise going forward um, was was huge and it got a lot of a lot of recognition because it was such a diverse opportunity to to tell those stories um awesome we'll go to the next slide now and so an important piece of of that in terms of telling those stories was also getting the stories of the small businesses and the the people who are in those communities again this is a, a community summit and so we actually went out me and other staff members went out to places like slide and leadville gateway communities along the trail who who are involved and have access to camp hale and 10 mile and recreate there um for one reason or another uh you know it's in their backyard and you know they we ask them, you know, do you want to see this preserved? Would you sign on to this effort? Do you care about this landscape and, and the CDT along it? And and the overwhelming answer was yes. <laughs> and it was great to have something so so positive to talk to that pretty much everybody in the communities where we went to uh, and the local businesses especially really, really cared about it. And we were able to get, you know, over just in one month of activity uh, as we were putting this together, this, this kind of push to get the, the proclamation done, we got over 50 sign-ons just from CDTC's work, uh, which was really impressive. And it represented not just uh, the area around it, but all corners of, of the state of Colorado. People really cared about this landscape in particular. And we were able to package that up uh, along with a bunch of other support materials. And, and it got delivered to you know all those signatures and the names of the businesses and, and the people in the local communities showing that support, you know, get to that gets sent over to the president and it gets put on his desk when Senator Bennett, you know, delivers that to him and says, look, look what we're doing here. You know, we really need to make this a priority. And it was cool to see that that get done at that level as well. Um, and appreciate all your support. <laughs> I know I'm sure there were people that got emails from us along the similar lines as Elle was talking about with the Completion Act. Um, so yeah, if you want to go to the next slide. And so uh, this photo uh, talks about future management in the sense that they're in the one year anniversary this year, we're finally getting around to, to actually what, you know, additional things can we do now that this is a, a national monument, you know, there are some restrictions, uh, you know, with that type of designation preservation, meaning that, you know, there's going to be no, no more extractive activities, let's say that can be written into the proclamation, but the way this one was written, just like a piece of legislation is written, you know, there are a lot of opportunities to say, this is what we want to do, and this is how we're going to do it now on the future management side. So it's going to be a multi-year process that engages a lot of different stakeholders, you know, motorized recreation, climbers, hikers, um, small businesses, indigenous communities, um, local communities. And so, you know, it, it's going to take some time to figure out what we can really, how we can use this national monument effort to educate 
not just the local areas, but outside. Um, and they really have been emphasizing the importance of tribal engagement and co-management, which CDTC has pushed for as well. At this particular meeting in October, they had the chairman of two of the Ute tribes from Colorado, and they spoke very highly of, of how they want to be involved and what they want to see at the monument um, from the tribal perspectives, which was, you know, which is what we're hoping that we can help, you know, they'll take the lead and we can help support. So that will hopefully allow us to um, connect with historically underrepresented communities. I talked about kind of that history at Camp Hill with segregation, but, you know, these meetings have largely been held in places like Vail, and there are communities within Vail or who live in Leadville or other areas nearby that uh, maybe not as represented in, in some of these spaces or or may not even be able to access Camp Hill on the surrounding landscape because of their work schedule and the challenges and the economics of the area. So um, really wanting to, you know, CGTC will continue to work with organizations like Next 100 Colorado, which is focused on outdoor equity so that we can and um, really have everyone have a say that dem so that the demographics of the area and the people there really match uh, what the priorities of that landscape and protection should be. And so um, going forward, again, we really see this as an opportunity to model, you know, when we have something that's at a national level, like a, a national monument, it, you can uh, Want, you want to apply the best practices that you see on the conservation, the recreation side, and really cite this as this is how, um, you know, public lands should be managed. And, and it's a great opportunity to do that through a national lens. So we're looking forward to, to being involved over the next couple of years with that, hopefully. Um, so it, it is ongoing. But um, yeah, if you want to go to the next slide, we'll just quickly also do a plug um, that, you know, there are more opportunities in Colorado besides the Camp Vale Continental Divide National Monument. National monuments are only one component of public lands conservation efforts. Um, and in our December issue of Passages in particular, we'll be talking about CDT, the CDT and the CDTC's impact on um, the local public lands uh, or priority landscapes, I should say, and our, our impact there um, in particular we will have we have a blog post um, by one of our interns who got to spend a month in the San Luis Valley and there are tons of opportunities there um, you know in the future to engage with communities and, and support um, public lands and recreation in, in appropriate ways um, in not just the Campbell area like I said but in other areas of Colorado too um, and so, yeah, there's a couple links in the chat there. I forgot to mention the um, the small business survey um, in terms of small business is that we interact with. We're, we're actively seeking more input from small businesses. And that's been, I think, extended till December 1st. Um, so this is a great opportunity for, for small businesses like we did with the Camp Hall campaign to, to, to really uh, provide their input on on how the CDT can best CDTC can best engage with that, um, as well as a blog the blog post that I mentioned about the San Luis Valley and some upcoming opportunities that hopefully CDTC can support there. So yeah, lots lots more to come, um, and I'm happy to turn it over to Corey. But I know we have a minute here, so if anyone has a burning question, there is time for Q and A at the end, but. Also, I don't want to feel like people, everyone has to be quiet until the end of the webinar either. So if there's anything um, that people have on their mind now for, for Elle or me, happy to jump in if something's burning, burning question. Otherwise, um, yeah, we'll go, we'll go over to Corey for our third part today. Awesome. Great. Oh, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, Thank you, Al uh, and Jordan. Definitely uh, a, a hard, uh, a hard line to follow. Uh, <laughs> um, but uh, definitely uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Corey Trivio. I am the New Mexico Regional Representative. Um, work closely with Al and what Jordan when it comes to policy issues or uh, issues surrounding uh, definitely land management and uh, land protection and trail protection. So. I just wanted, you know, just to share a little bit about, you know, the importance of, you know, building relationships into partnerships with Pueblos, tribes, and nations. And it's really just a reflection, you know, to really help, you know, all of you better understand the importance, you know, of working with indigenous communities and 
and what it is that um, is in, is important to them in a lot of in a lot of different ways when we look at views and and values of uh, doing conservation work uh, as opposed to uh, stewardship work. And so, you know, just to touch a little bit uh, more, you know, about you know myself, you know, I'm from the Pueblo of Acoma. I live uh, on the Pueblo of Acoma. I also live here in Rio Rancho on the stolen lands of the Tewa people. Um, I have uh, come from a very uh, a big family on my side, so uh, it's definitely uh, amazing to be here tonight. So, um, so just to get right into it, uh, Al, if you want to go ahead and go on to the next slide. So when we talk about you know building relationships, you know into uh, into partnerships. You know we want to really understand the objectives of that. You know what are the objectives when we talk objectives when we talk about that? You know one of them is definitely land acknowledgement. You know. And the importance of that, you know, I think that was reflected in uh, what Liz definitely did at the very start of the presentation or the summit, you know, definitely acknowledging that, you know, it's very important, you know, especially to know that, you know, tribes understand that, you know, uh, where they're at and, and who they are as individuals and also as a as a nation, a Pueblo or a tribe. And so definitely, you know, one of the objectives, you know, in, in land acknowledgement is also really understanding indigenous history and culture. You know, and that really weighs into the views versus values into this. So really in this short section here, we're just going to just kind of cover kind of these objectives and what it kind of follows and what it's about. And so, Al, if you like, you can go ahead and, uh, go ahead and jump to the next uh, slide. And so when we talk about land acknowledgement. we got to make sure that we remember who we're definitely talking about and, and who it is that it's important. You know, the history, you know, definitely in understanding their culture is important. You know, so listening, listening to the past. You know is, is is important you know and it, in, in this you know i definitely add a little bit of quotes here that a lot of you can just uh, take the time to read on your own as i'm speaking here and i'm talking about the importance of really understanding the past it's really important to you know really acknowledge that we as indigenous people really have a, a overpowering protection of our people our lands and of course our cultural values and that really become that really comes from uh, from it being uh, uh, when we were being removed from our lands and being forced to live at, at other areas across the United States, and so really reflecting onto that, you know, we want to make sure that we understand, you know, the history and the past of that. And so as we move forward, you know, we want to make sure that we listen to those proverbs and we listen to the people that have had to say something about their experience you know in in the earlier part of when the europeans were uh starting to advance westward uh, uh towards california and so uh al if you like you can go right into the next slide so definitely you know when we want to talk about you know definitely building those relationships and we start to understand the history of indigenous people you know we start to really learn about the land acknowledgement and what's seeded and stolen as definitely uh, mean to indigenous people. We want to make sure that we definitely understand that there's two different types of outreach and consultation that we can do. There's definitely the formal, which of course a lot of our governments, government to government relations do, you know, and so there's also this informal uh, consultation and outreach. And one of the most important things about the informal part as opposed to the formal is that informal is very, is very on hands. You know, you're really on the ground, you're meeting people on the left side of the triangle as opposed to the right side where everything has already been done and complete. So a lot of the informal really consultation and outreach is important because you're establishing a relationship with a group of people that you're really learning about. Now, again, you need to understand that when you're building these relationships, when we talked about earlier about, you know, about the history and about learning about the culture of the of, of indigenous people is that you know, we're not all the same. Uh, we, we're all indigenous, yes, um, but our culture is different. Our traditions are different. A lot of things that we do is a lot different from each other's, but we all have the same belief as everybody else across, you know, the world does, and is that there is a creator. Um, in, that, in that sense, you need to understand that we put a lot of power and faith and belief into that. And so when you're really looking at doing informal consultation and outreach you need to understand that you're you're focusing on the people who value the land more of of how it's going to be there for generations to come as opposed to a value uh is which we'll, we'll get into a little bit more a little bit later and so as we're you know definitely de developing that outreach you know and then the consultation of the informal 
you know, we want to understand what agencies do we work with? You know, do we already work with agencies? Do we work with other nonprofits? You know, what does that relationship already look like? Is it already exist? What is the condition of that relationship? Is that relationship stale? Is it stalled? Is there a relationship that's never been really tested or has not really been built along? So you definitely want to make sure that as you're doing outreach, you want to focus on those those attentions to these main, I guess you would say main um, topics about what you're doing as you get into tribes. Because when you get to a tribe and you start talking about consultation, whether it be informal and formal, again, you understand that the, the people that you're talking with, you know, for many generations have been lied to, uh, their lands have been stolen, your children have been misplaced or, or relocated. And so you're, you know, you're dealing with people that definitely has a lot of generational trauma uh, instilled in them. And so learning how to uh, learning how to relate with them is can be a little difficult because, again, we don't trust people um, because of what has happened uh, to us in the past. And sometimes that uh, ability to wanting to work and engage with tribes can definitely be a barrier. And that barrier can be is that we may never open that door for you fully. And being able to understand that and accept that is 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 a great attribute to yourself in, in showing us as indigenous people that you're willing to um, stick through it, whether it be whether the tough times be or the good times be. And the reason is, is that we don't feel that we want to be a checkbox. And that's important to recognize is that as you're building that outreach and you're working towards that consultation, you want to make sure that it's definitely something that is very important, you know, is that, you know, whether it's informal or formal consultation that you do, let's remember that. And so as we move on to the next slide, Al, you know, definitely I'll talk a little bit more about hearing the voices of nature. Now, the voices of nature really speak through a lot of us as indigenous people. Hearing the words that we speak, you know, a lot of people say, oh, gosh, you know, it's like, Oh, that's all we hear is oh they're connected to the earth oh you know they're you know they're attached to the stars and they can read how the moon set and the sun rises you know this is uh definitely you know in all in all it's you know all all of all of a big uh a, a lot of a, a big joke for a lot of us as indigenous people because we recognize how people look at us and view us as a stereotype 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 people of being this really spiritually connected to the earth indigenous people we're normal just like everyone else we have feelings just like everyone else and be able to understand that and be able to relate with that really can really emphasize more on who we are as individuals and what we talk about when you hear us talk about the land when you hear us talk about mother earth you need to recognize that the importance of these voices of from nature is that we are their children, those are our brothers, those are our sisters. Every plant, every tree, every rock, every river, every fish, every wildlife that exists out there, we are connected to them. And the reason why we're connected to them is this was the indigenous way of thinking is that we are only able to work together as one and we can only grow and be strong as one. And so we recognize the value in that. And as we move into the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Definitely that connection about being as one, you know, and it really comes down to about the history of tribes and our nations, you know, learning the communities that you're building your relationships, you know, how do you, you know, understand their culture, you know, because again, like I said, we're all indigenous, but we are all unique in our own separate ways. And being able to really understand that our culture really falls into having that respect for what we do and why we do it. You know, too many times across, you know, across the United States, you know, people always ask, you know, and, you know, I've heard this before in the past, you know, it's like, why, why is their Pueblo closed? You know, I thought we defeated them. And, you know, so, you know, why, why did they have to close it off and why we allowed in there? No more? So, you know, you hear these, you know, types of comments that are always being shared out there, you know, so, Understanding that you have to have that respect for their cultural beliefs. If you want to build relationships and build partnerships with indigenous people, is that their their cultural beliefs is, is the most important part of their world to them. And, and, a, and, a, and I say this in a sense to say that a lot of Native Americans who have that 
strong cultural belief, traditional belief, well, will go to beyond means to protect that from the outside world. And that's important to recognize. It's important to recognize that because when you recognize the importance of their cultural beliefs, you can actually see the impacts of what has been caused in the past. Because of this, you know, you see the historical markers with uh, stereotyping indigenous people as being murderers and savages. You know, still to this day, you know, we still see them across the United States. And it labels us and it, it stereotypes us as a type of people who are violent. And so our younger generation starts to starts to learn those concepts of who we are as indigenous people. And so it's, you know, it's it's important to put that to the side and really understand that, you know, we're, you know, we're a people that are probably never going to forgive or never going to forget, but that doesn't mean that we can't move forward. That doesn't mean that we can't heal together. And that's something that you need to understand and recognize what you're dealing and working with indigenous communities as you're building those relationships, because you're going to hit brick walls at every turn that you make, because we want to learn the history of you as a person. Are you trustworthy? Can we can we believe in the words that you're telling us, or are you just going to take just like everybody else has done this, this coming to our communities over the many many years? So that's something we definitely want to watch out for. And as we step into the next slide, you know, it just covers a little bit more about you know some of the voices again about the future. You know, what is it that we see in the future? And if you look at these quotes, you know, it is happening to this day. You know, and and these quotes were written back in the 1800s. And you can see what is happening to our world today, how it is changing over time. And Mother Earth, you know, uh, I'll tell you right now, in our retrospects, she's going to heal herself one day. And she's going to wipe us clean if we don't start understanding and start taking care of her needs and her values. And being able to recognize that as you're working with Indigenous people can really make that bond a lot stronger. And so as we step into the last slide here, it talks a little bit more about in-depth about Views versus values. Western conservation views, you know, what is important to them? Very definitely what is important to them is development. How do we develop this land? What is the future use of it? How can we conserve this land for future green energy development or for future mining uh, prospects? Or, you know, what other, other avenues can we make an income from preserving or conserving this area of such? You know, and we got to understand, you know, how does that work? Who's, whose favor does that work in when we talk about bison, you know? Is it, you know, who are we doing conservation work for when we're looking at it from a Western view? You know, we got to understand that conservation work has the word con in it, which means to manipulate or take advantage of. So we talk about Western conservation views. We're looking at, talk, we're looking about conserving the land for future development, whether it be for homes, for green energy, or for gas and oil and understanding that and, and understanding who does that favor and why it doesn't favor for, for one thing, does it favor the water, the headwaters doesn't favor the fish, doesn't favor the wildlife that exists out there, the plants, you know, the trees. And why is that? You know, so we need to understand that we're getting to diversity, you know, practice what we preach because when we talk about diversity, we need to take a good look. And when we step outside into our forest lands, that is the best type of advice mother nature can ever give any of us. And if you're ever standing at an edge and you're sitting on a canyon, you're looking and you see this vast valley valley before you and you see a massive canyon with beautiful trees, you need to understand that diversity has created that beauty. Every tree is different. Every plant is different. Every insect, every tree, every bird, every, every animal that exists in there is, is, is different. And it's like that diversity that brings that. And if you recognize that diversity, then you can really start to understand indigenous values as they talk about conservation and stewardship. Indigenous values, what is important to us? What is important to us is that the importance is that land is, is a value to us because 10 generations down from us need that for their life, for their support, the headwaters, the wildlife that exists what mother nature can provide. And, you know, it's funny because, you know, who is it, you know, when we talk about the values and what's important, we talk about bias, you know, who is it against, you know, it, it's always against 
our mother, it's always against mother nature and what she has to provide. And we got to understand when we talk about the value of that, it's very important to recognize that. We see that it's important to recognize that when we talk about mother nature and the importance of her, the value that it lies in it is not what it can provide to us in a financial state, but what it can provide to our people 10 generations down and give our children a home, a place to live, headwaters that they can drink fresh water from, places that they can visit that have religious and cultural significance to them. And so understand that is very important. When we talk about inclusion, why are we not at that table? And that's very important to recognize. So as you're working with indigenous communities and building those relationships, understand that why are we not at that table? It's because we're not invited. And if we're invited, we definitely can offer our views and we can definitely offer our advice as how to do things and how to improve things, you know, on a on a on an even basis. And that's really what we talk about, visit building bridges. And so in the last quote here, you know, definitely I just wanted to share this, you know, with you all. It is one of my favorite, you know, and I definitely hope that it reflects the same thing on everything about us as humans and who we are and that we are only here on borrowed time and that definitely this earth doesn't belong to us, belongs to our children and their children. And so with that, I just like to say thank you for giving this opportunity to talk a little bit about how we build relationships into uh, into partnerships. And if you have any questions, uh, you're more free to ask me or you can actually email me too. So. Uh, thank you again for Alan Jordan for giving me this time. And uh, yeah, thank you much, guys. Awesome. Thank you so much, Corey. Um, and so with that, um, we'll we'll kind of start wrapping up our webinar here. Um, we've only got like two more slides and then we'll have a little bit of time for question and answer uh, portion as well. Um, but as you can hear um, uh, from what Cora was talking about, what was Jordan, all the uh, all the work that Jordan's doing in Colorado, all the work happening in New Mexico, um, and all the work happening across the trail for completion, um, there's a lot of opportunities to engage. We've got a lot going on, and you know I only see that work kind of continuing to grow um, at this current rate. So um, there's definitely opportunities to engage in this coming year. Um, in February, we'll have hike the hill. So um, all our partnership from the National Trail System, so all our national scenic and historic trails converge on Washington, D.C. with the American Hiking Society. Um, and we really try to, you know, elevate the voices of our hiking and trails community. Um, and so um, there are opportunities um, during Hike the Hill to help, you know, kind of elevate CDTC's message as we head to D.C. We want to make sure um, decision makers there are hearing from our communities on the ground. So definitely chances to engage. There might be opportunities for some virtual fly-ins as well um, uh, with uh, decision makers and their staff. Um, uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely stay um, on the lookout for more of those opportunities. Um, next year, we're also in January through May, kind of when the legislative sessions happen um, on the state level, we're, we'll be, we're piloting something. We're, we're, uh, have a placeholder name for now called Hike the Foothills. Um, thanks to Jordan for this suggestion, but uh, hiking the foothills, meaning we're hiking the, the smaller hills in our stateside um, side of the legislature. So there will be similar opportunities to engage um, depending on, you know, kind of what legislation pops up in those, uh, those sessions. Um, uh, states operate a little bit differently. So just be on the lookout for that. Um, there will certainly be opportunities to engage uh, in New Mexico and Colorado. Um, and then in April, we'll have our trail day. So we'll be celebrating um, the 10 years of designation of uh, Silver City's designation um, of their gateway community. And we'll have, be having um, some advocacy and policy um, uh, talks there as well. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, and then I did uh, want to point out that in June, we have National Trails Day. Oftentimes we have, that's a day of action or a week of action leading up to that day. So oftentimes we'll send out a toolkit that you can, um, used to get involved as well. Um, and then, you know, we always, you know, have stuff like the CDT Completion Act uh, here and that happened kind of at the end of the year as Congress tries to, you know, rush things through. Um, so there's always a lot of opportunities to engage throughout the year, um, always have uh, new stuff popping up. So definitely um, ways to get engaged if you're looking at how you can, you know, further support the CDT. Um, sorry, there we go. Um, and then how you can really take action today. So. You know, I know I shared a lot about what uh, a lot was shared today and the best way to kind of keep up with all of this um, this policy engagement advocacy kind of 
uh, uh, world uh, for CDTC is signing up for our advocacy alerts. Um, so I think a link will be dropped in uh, the chat. And so those advocacy alerts go out. Uh, uh, next year, we'll be going out more regularly um, just to keep uh, everyone up to date on kind of the advocacy efforts happening across the trail. Um, but those advocacy alerts also go out when we need like an action. Um, so we this just this week, we sent out an advocacy alert to our entire Wyoming listserv to say, um, please speak up and call it Senator Brasso. So we also have um, those chances to engage kind of more in this play space. So those advocacy alerts are a really great tool to know what's happening in your region. And, um, you know, there's aren't just, you know, to the trail states, um, almost anyone across the U.S. will have an opportunity to engage um, specifically on the CDT Completion Act. Um, you know, we need all the voices from across the U.S. Um, and, you know, international people as well. Great support. Um, so um, definitely sign up for advocacy alerts. Stay up to date. Um, follow us on social media. We always post a lot of our advocacy efforts. Um, if there are any actions need to be taken on our social medias. Um, and then... You know, I did give our emails at the beginning of uh, this webinar and they're on the next slide as well, but we want to hear your ideas. Um, you know, uh, we have these, you know, kind of regular events like the or regular priorities like the CDT Completion Act. But, um, you know, if there are things happening in your community, um, you know, Jordan shared um, how they uh, helped mobilize around the Camp Hale Continental Divide National Monument in Leadville and Vail. Um, those are two communities. Um, along the CDT. If you have ideas for how you would like CDTC to either, you know, support, help um, mobilize your community around specific things impacting the CDT, or that will just, you know, kind of uh, improve the trail experience in your community, um, we definitely want to hear from you. I am all ears when it comes to that stuff. So um, I definitely want, uh, you know, our CDTC advocacy to remain very much at a grassroots level. So um, definitely share um, all those ideas with us. We want to hear directly from you. Um, and so do our decision makers. So we're happy to be that bridge if we can help um, in any way. Um, and then, yeah, most importantly, just continue to stay connected. You all have my email now. If there are issues impacting your uh, your area or if you live in Colorado or New Mexico and have, you know, want to talk to Corey and Jordan about things happening in your area, definitely stay connected with us because our most, uh, you know, our most valuable information comes from our communities, comes from the peoples on the ground, comes from the hikers on the trail. Um, so definitely uh, continue to stay connected, especially on these important impacts um, that can uh, impact the entire trail and entire communities along the continental divide. We want to hear from you. Uh, and with that, I will open it up for questions. Um, Actually, uh, Al, I just want to just add just one little thing. Now, definitely uh, me and Jordan, you know, do a lot of work, you know, and advocacy and also in a lot of different areas. But I also had dropped some links uh, in our agenda um, that definitely wanted to share what people want outreach and education, our community engagement, our volunteer and our adopt the section. So uh, definitely those are definitely, you know, areas that if any of you are interested in looking at, you know, what is it that we're doing, you know, as far as outreach and, you know, education or our community engagement or volunteer, you know, or adopt the section, you know, those definitely, you know, you know, those are areas that, you know, we definitely can help you with, you know, and support you in, you know, so know that those are out there too. So I just wanted to just add that in there, uh, George, uh, sorry, uh, Al. Yeah, thank you, Al. Oh, excellent. Thanks for jumping in there, Corey. Yeah, oftentimes, you know, if uh, maybe if advocacy and policy isn't your lane, like Corey said, there are tons of offers, other opportunities and vice versa. If you've only, you know, ever, you know, volunteered on the trail project, um, but you want to get more involved in advocacy or, you know, contacting your, your decision maker, Oftentimes, the best advocates for, you know, talking about we need more trail funding are the people, you know, building the trail. Um, so, you know, our best advocates um, are those people who are also volunteering in those other sectors. So, no, appreciate that, Corey. And, um, yeah, I'll stop sharing my screen now, um, but I'm sure we can drop contact info in the chat if we need it. Um, but, yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to, happy to get some discussion. It's nice to see everyone's faces because when you're presenting, you can't see anybody. So you're just like talking into a black box. So it's like, oh, there's actually people here. It's so nice. <laughs> I'll ask one if uh, nobody else has one. Um, I'm really glad that you guys brought up those like missing links in the trail um, earlier in the presentation. So I just had like a question for clarification around that. Um, where the missing links are leaving gateway communities is that just an issue of its state highway and private property that's inhibiting those links to footpaths? And if that is the issue, 
how do you work with that? And if it's not, what's the other solution? Yeah, really great question, Kenny. And so like um, our gap areas, there's definitely like no uniform, uh, no uniform, I guess, like, you know, barrier to that section being completed. Um, with most of the sections of the trail that are still, that are, our, you know, that last 5%, um, it's kind of um, uh, a patchwork of land management issues. So, um, you know, so the CDT crosses local, state, federal, tribal, um, private land. Um, as well. And so these last remaining sections are kind of like you described, um, oftentimes like nearer to communities where there is more of a patchwork of land. Um, and so that is why um, that the, that CDT Completion Act, we've kind of seen um, the, the, the need for that because there's that need for um, increased collaboration when there's multiple land managers involved. Um, and so um, just really uh, what that bill does is incentivizes that more of, of that conversation happening across um, land managers. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that answered your question, hopefully, but uh, if you have anything else, I'm happy to clarify more. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. Does um the recent management plan for uh, the Red Desert, like um, outside Rollins, help with that footpath at all? Or is that like completely unrelated? Um, I'm unsure. I have not dived into that resource management plan, but wow, uh, love that someone's familiar. Um, it's really <laughs> yeah. great. Um, but um, I think currently from what I've seen, it uh, the the gap we have around Rollins is so close to town. I don't think that plan necessarily addresses it. Sure. Um, but I, the BLM will certainly be involved in those conversations around Rollins, um, certainly. So um, making sure it's a priority in that resource management plan of uh, relocating the CDT, making sure their eyes are on the CDT. Um, but for that specific gap section, I don't know if that plan will have that much sway with it, but it can, um, you know, within the life of that plan kind of, put forth some desired conditions for the CDT in that section. Um, so that could help just kind of move the conversation along for sure. Cool, thanks Al. Yeah, yeah, yeah you, I just wanted to add a little context, uh, Colorado specific, because I know Kenny, you, you're, you live in Colorado, and I know Jeff does, and and Elise, so just as a context of like what I was talking about in specifics, um, yeah, Muddy Pass between Steamboat and Kremling, there's that 12 mile gap that isn't a highway because there's not, protected public land for it to go on. So there are private land uh, essentially in between BLM and Forest Service right around that Highway 40, Highway 14 intersection at Muddy Pass. So that is the, the main barrier. If there was a public land connection option, I think we could get it done really fast, but we have to work with the private landowners um, to, to find a solution to that. And that involves a lot of community engagement and stuff as well in terms of reaching out to them. And, and so not only, you know, are we working with the BLM in that, in that area, because they would be the ones who would help in some type of land exchange or easement, but we, we have to work with private landowners, which inevitably just takes longer to build those relationships. So, um, so that, that's just, and then an example of you're talking about, I'm glad we're getting into resource management plans and forest service plans, but for example, in the Gunnison National Forest, in their recent forest plan, they specifically state that they would like to move the CDT off of motorized routes. So there, there are management tools at the administrative level when you're talking about a BLM office or a forest service office that we will advocate for and say, but yeah, don't forget about the CDT. You still need to complete that or you still need to improve the trail. And, and we'll advocate for that too at the administrative level so that um, it's built into that plan. We can relate back to that as well to get get it complete. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> we could have a whole other uh, a whole other webinar about <laughs> the individual gaps, and we will have a story map coming out uh, publicly for the Money Pass one in particular that will kind of tell that story of of the wildlife and the private lands issues to start. So more to come. Sure, it's quite the puzzle. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I won't leave us all sitting in silence for too long. Um, I'm a big 15 second rule person for silence, and then it starts to get uncomfortable. Um, so no, I appreciate you all for, uh, you know, sticking around so much. Um, like I said, you all have our contact information. We are very much, you know, 
please reach out. We I, I love talking to people. Um, and so it's so great to see all your faces and stuff. So um, definitely stay in touch. Um, and yeah, I just want to say again, like, uh, very much appreciate all, you know, the time and thoughtfulness of just coming to this discussion and, uh, you know, asking questions and being involved. That's, you know, the first step to, you know, getting involved and stuff. So uh, really appreciate, um, yeah, you all being here. And um, yeah, please don't be a stranger. And then I don't know, Liz or Claire, if you have anything else to, you know, close us out here. But um, yeah, I just want to say how much I appreciate you all for being here. Yeah, thank you all. I think that pretty much covers it, Elle. And, um, you know, we have one final session on the 29th. So we'll follow up with resources from tonight and um, just remind everyone if you're available on the 29th, uh, we'll have one final session starting at 5 p.m. So hope to see you there. But yeah, thanks CDTC team and thanks everyone for joining us tonight.